Good morning. Good morning. Hey, buddy. Anybody excited to be in the Lord's house this morning? Yes. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
sometimes get in years looking for that train. They have to overcome a lot of difficulties and challenges. Jesus says, He said, This train is worth finding because it involves the following rights and privileges and responsibilities that are second to God. The problem is today that many people have settled for our treasures. A treasure is worth fighting for, but when you just settle in, when you, you live an ordinary life, never discover this special thing that God has treasured for us all. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, that this treasure, this kingdom of heaven, is a treasure like one that's hidden in a field. It's worth searching for and digging out because it has so very, very much to offer. Men, God has a standard. He will not lower his standard to us, but he invites us to raise our standard to him to discover this awesome treasure. So many men have been lowered the standard of living with scars. And the scars are everywhere. Not only in their lives, but in the lives of those they touch. The scars that lead to low self-esteem or even aimless. And it is a direct result of the abuse or neglect of biblical manhood. That must change. Yet it cannot change unless we raise the standard to where God originally placed it. Men, we've got to raise the standard and remind ourselves of manhood as God originally intended it to be. Join me and other men from around the world on a journey to rediscover what it means to be a kingdom. Good morning, church. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Stirred up. Good, good. I love that, Ray Ray. I love being stirred up. Hey, as you saw the video there, that's the last advertisement of Kingdom Man. Uh, you will see uh, in, in, for now anyway, uh, the Bible study actually starts Tuesday evening next door in the fellowship hall at 7 p.m., if you have requested that I purchase your book for you, see me afterwards and retrieve that book so you have it when you come Tuesday. Uh, if you didn't sign up or you have friends that you may want to bring along with you to participate and you haven't signed them up, it's okay. It's okay. Bring them anyway. And if necessary, I'll make copies of whatever pages they'll need in order to be able to follow along in the study and that we can get them plugged in, okay? In other words, uh, not only do I feel like there's not a man in this church that couldn't benefit from this, but uh, I echo what Tony said there, and the fact is is that men all around the world could benefit from getting back to biblical manhood instead of worldly manhood. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, with that said, uh, you have your little cups. So that's a, a very strong hint. You don't have to get them right now, but, but you're well trained. Uh, you, you have all of your little cups, okay? Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a bold hint that we're going to be doing the Lord's Supper. Considering that we're going to be doing the Lord's Supper, as I was praying through and thinking about this, man, the Lord just, just pressed on my heart and... Uh, and in doing so, he reminded me of where I came from. And I came from a place of not knowing. I didn't know what church was about. I didn't know what being a part of the body of Christ was about. I didn't know uh, the importance of gathering together in, in fellowship and in praise, you know. I didn't know the importance and the necessity of, of tithing and baptism and even the Lord's Supper. So much so that some of you have heard me say this before, the very first time that I was ever uh, not invited so much but heard about the Lord's Supper, I was excited. And, and here's the thing, I was excited because I thought, this is cool. I'm in a new church, the first thing they're doing is inviting me to dinner. Right? And, and so I showed up all fired up about what we was going to eat. And they gave me a little bit of wafer and a little bit of jar of juice like this. Needless to say, I had to go dig clean out. Okay? 
The point with that is, and it is humorous, but the point with that is, so many people really don't understand the significance of the things that we do as the body of Christ. With that said, today, I'm actually going to preach on the Lord's Supper. And as I preach on the Lord's Supper, I'm praying that this gives you a, 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 a broader and greater vision of what uh, doing the Lord's Supper biblically really means to us. Okay? Uh, with that said, uh, we're not going to be in John this week. We're in 1 Corinthians. The reading is going to come out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 27. Uh, the study itself is going to come out of Genesis chapter 12 all the way to 1 Corinthians. So again, this week, you need to have your pencil sharpened and plenty of paper. Master, stand in honor of God's word. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Our Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your beloved Son, Jesus, who gave us the new institution of, of the Lord's Supper and, and the meaning and purpose behind it. And Father, I pray today that you clear all of our hearts, all of our minds. Father, uh, just empty us of ourselves so that you can fill us with biblical knowledge of the importance and the celebratory act that we get to participate in uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that, uh, that your will be done and that you stand me behind the cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, Interestingly enough, in Tony's video there, talked about raising and lowering the standards. Uh, we have a new neighbor in our, in our area. It's kind of down the road and around the corner from us, but this new neighbor happens to be one that, that we've been passing back and forth by their house now for a couple of years. The new neighbor built another little house on their property, and apparently... Their son and daughter and grandson has moved into that little house. Um, and, and you're thinking, okay, so, well, here's the thing. That little kid has probably every toy known to man strung out all over their yard. But here not too long ago, I drove by and I seen that there was one of those portable regulation size basketball goals there. And I'm thinking, cool, mom and dad are getting outside, going to play a little basketball, right, while the, while the little one, little boy's playing on his toys. The next day when I came by, though, that regulation size goal that was way up here was lowered to the lowest it could go all the way down here so that that little boy could make the baskets. I share that with you for this reason. I believe... Uh, that the church, the whole church, not just this church, the whole church, I believe that we have um, unintentionally and even unconsciously allowed the, the, the magnitude of the Lord's Supper to pass us by. You know, and, and, and because of that, I'm praying that as it appears to me, that the standards of the Lord's Supper has been lowered, that we need to raise it back up to the level that it that it deserves to be at. Amen. Okay? 
Uh, so considering that and thinking about the Lord's Supper, your first point of stop lowering the standards, which is the sermon title, your first point is this, historicity over the Passover meal. That was almost a tongue twister. Historicity <laughs> over the Passover meal. I felt like if, if I was going to say something about the Lord's Supper, I needed to give you a little bit of history about how we came about the Lord's Supper. And in doing so, that caused a massive Bible study for me personally. And out of that Bible study, uh, I developed these thoughts that I want to share with you. First off, uh, some of you, maybe not all of you, but some of you know that the Passover and God's institution of the Passover happened in Exodus chapter 12. Okay, uh, when the children of Israel were were about to about to uh, have the exodus out of Egyptian slavery, but that prompted another question: How did the children of Israel end up in slavery to begin with? And so, uh, in in researching and studying and going through everything, uh, there was a gentleman in the Bible that God had favor on, and his name was Abraham. Abraham had a son who God continued to have favor on, and his name was Isaac. And Isaac had a son that God continued to have favor on, and his name was Jacob. Now, when God had favor on Abraham originally, he told Abraham uh, that he was going to bless him and that all the offspring of the earth would come from him. That was a, a, a continual promise into Isaac's hands. And then, it, and then that promise overflowed into Jacob's hands. Well, Jacob had 12 sons. But one of his sons, and I know none of y'all do this, right? One of his sons was the highly favored one. Okay? Hence, if you've ever heard of blessed and highly favored, well, it may have came from that particular text, okay? Uh, but this particular son was highly favored. His name was Joseph, okay? Jacob loved Joseph so much that he had this special uh, covering made for him. It was a very colorful uh, covering, and it, he just outwardly expressed his favoritism over Joseph. And because he outwardly expressed his favoritism over Joseph, all of the other boys hated him. Joseph didn't help his cause any uh, because he added fuel to the fire when he received some dreams from the Lord. Uh, it might have been wiser to just kind of uh, retain them in itself but instead, he went and told his dad and his brothers about the dreams, and the dream was this, that there would come a time when his father and his brothers and all of the family would bow down to him, worship him. Well, I'm sure you can figure out that that didn't go over real well in the home of Jacob and all of the other brothers. So as the, all the other brothers were out attending their flocks, one day uh, uh, Jacob tells Joseph, go out and check on your brothers and see how they're doing. So he goes out to check on them. Well, as he's approaching them, they see him coming. They're like, you know, there's that scandalous brother of ours. This is a grand opportunity. Let's go ahead and kill him. And so their, their immediate plan was they're going to put this cat to death. He's no longer going to be dad's highly favored one. And they're out in the wilderness so they can concoct a story to, to authenticate the murder that they commit. The problem with that was Joseph had one semi-decent semi brother in that group named Reuben. He was the oldest brother. And he was like, oh, no, no, guys. We can't kill him. We can't have his blood on our hands. And so the, 
the backup plan for lack of better words, lack of better words, the backup plan was apparently there was a pit close by. And so as Joseph approached his brothers, his brothers converged on him, took him hostage for lack of better words, and threw him in the pit. Well, fast forwarding a little bit further, uh, there were some Ishmaelites on the journey to Egypt. And as they were on the journey to Egypt, they were passing by where uh, uh, Jacob's sons were and Joseph was in the pit. And they drug Joseph out of the pit because now instead of killing him, they didn't have his blood on their hands. They still needed to get rid of him. So they draw him up out of the pit and they sell him into slavery to the Ishmaelites. Bear with me, we're going somewhere, okay? So, with that said, the Ishmaelites take him, they go to Egypt. When they get to Egypt, the Ishmaelites, they need to recover their money that they paid for this cat, and so what do they do? They sell him to Potiphar. Potiphar is a, a, a high-ranking official in, 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 in the uh, governor's house, governor's clan at the time, okay? And so Potiphar hangs on to Joseph for a little while, and there's some controversy there. Potiphar's wife got eyes for Joseph. Joseph don't have eyes for her. He flees from her. She keeps his, his, his very ornate little jacket behind, concocts a story that, you know, he was trying to uh, uh, become more than friends with her. And so, you know, she told this to everybody else. Well, when it got back to Potiphar, he got so mad about it, he put Joseph in prison. While Joseph was in prison, he interpreted a couple of dreams. Because of the interpretive, uh, interpretation of a couple of those dreams, fast forwarding a little bit further, uh, there, there, there became another guy named Pharaoh. And if Pharaoh had a dream, and when Pharaoh had this dream, he called in all of the wise men. He called in all of the all of the preachers, all of the teachers, everybody that was supposed to know everything, even the magicians, he called in, okay? And, and, and when he called them in, he told them this dream and nobody could interpret it. As it turns out, one of the prisoners that was in jail with uh, Joseph remembered that Joseph had interpreted his dream. And so he tells... Uh, 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 he tells the, the governor there that there is one in prison, this Hebrew, that can interpret dreams. And so he sends for him, and Joseph comes out, and, and so uh, he's told the dream, and then Joseph interprets the dream, which basically means that was basically said the land was going to prosper for seven years. And after seven years, seven years, a great famine was going to come upon the land, famine that had never been seen before, okay? And, uh, and because Joseph was able to interpret these dreams, he became Pharaoh's instantaneous second in charge. So he was the governor of all the land now. And so you're thinking, okay, what does that have to do with us? Well, when the, fa fa when the phantom happened, everybody got hungry. And when everybody got hungry, they started coming to Egypt because Egypt had plentiful food because Joseph had done such a good job governing everything they had that they had plenty left in storage. Some of the people that came to Egypt looking at Joseph for some food, lo and behold, who do you think that was? His brothers. The interesting thing is they didn't recognize him. And, and so through a bunch of tests and everything, uh, Joseph de decided that they were worthy to be able to be helped and everything like that. They went through a bunch of tests for him to come up with that decision. In the midst of that, uh, he identified who he was to his brothers, and then they were really terrified. Okay? Uh, because now then all of a sudden the brother that we wanted to kill that we threw in the pit that we sold into slavery is now the governor of the place that we're trying to come get food. That's a bad day for them. Right? But as it turns out, Joseph, a man of God, had sympathy on them. So much sympathy that he sent 
a couple of different times food to care for them and his father and everyone else. Pharaoh found out about it, though. And Pharaoh found, when Pharaoh found out, he told Joseph, man, go, go, go get your family. Send for your family and, and have them come here. Okay? Well, the part of the story that I didn't share with you was, in Genesis 32, God was, uh, or, 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 I'm sorry, Jacob was scattering his clan because of, a, of a, a fight he thought was about to break out. In the midst of that, the fight didn't break out, but yet another fight did break out throughout the whole night long, and that is uh, what the Bible uh, presents to us as Jacob fighting with a man all night long. Some of your translations will say fighting with the Lord all night long. And, and, and if the, as the sun rose... The fight needed to be over, but Jacob wouldn't let go, and Jacob wouldn't let go. He said, until you bless me, I'm not going to let go. And, and so the, the, the God man said, okay, no problem. Your name is Jacob. From now on, it's going to be Israel. Okay? The name Israel then is, is Jacob's father's name who he sends to bring into the land of Egypt. They live plentiful and bountifully. Uh, uh, Pharaoh gives them the plushest land of, of, of all of Egypt. Everything is going well, but as happens in, in, in life, right? People passed away. One thing led to another, and all of a sudden there was a new Pharaoh. This new Pharaoh, though, by, by this point, the Hebrews, the Israelites, had multiplied to several hundred thousand. That was a great concern for Pharaoh. His concern was we can't release these people back into their own land because if we do, they could partner up with somebody else that doesn't like us, come against us, and they could conquer us. So instead, the slavery began. And he started treating the Israelites very, very poorly. Well, you know then, in Exodus chapter 3, and if you don't know, read Exodus chapter 3 or get my notes afterwards and you can go and search it. But in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is out taking care of, of Jethro, his father-in-law's flock. And as he's coming along uh, the trail there, there's that burning bush that we've talked about in John's gospel several times. And uh, so Moses and his brother Aaron are supposed to go into Egypt and gather the people of Israel and bring them out. Pharaoh's not so cooperative, though. So the plagues come upon Pharaoh. The plagues are, are mentioned in, 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 you can read about all of this from Exodus chapter 1 to Exodus chapter 12, but in chapter 12, the final plague is the 10th plague. It's the worst plague. Pharaoh's kind of acted like you and I sometimes, right? Lord, I repent of that. I will never do it again. In the moment you, you, your guilt is off of you, somehow or another, you return right back to that. Right? So, so, so Pharaoh then was doing the same thing, similar to what we do sometimes. And in the midst of that, God got so angry with him, he says, I'm going to kill the firstborn of everybody and everything. But he had a conversation with Moses, and he said, I want you to tell my people to sacrifice a lamb, a perfect lamb, without blemish, without scar, without illness, without problem. Sacrifice that one for each home. And if the home isn't large enough, gather two homes together so that they can participate together. God tells Moses, tell them when they slaughter the lamb to take hyssops and dip it in the blood and wipe it across the lintel and the doorpost of their houses. And then when that happens, when the angel of death comes, we'll pass over their houses. Okay? They did as Moses said, and the firstborn of all of the people in Egypt was dying throughout the night. Pharaoh's was the first because of his hard heart. Okay? And so everybody's wailing and crying and screaming because all their firstborn were dying. Firstborn of their cattle, sheep, everything else was dying. So Pharaoh calls for 
Moses and Aaron in the middle of the night and says, take your people, take everything you said you wanted, and get out of here. And so the institution of the Passover is instituted in that moment because the people had eaten that lamb like God had said and put blood over their lentils and their doorposts like God had said. But because of the angel of death's of presence there and all of the people dying, Pharaoh's uh, desire for them to leave the land was instantaneous. He didn't want them to wait. So much so that they didn't even have any leaven in their bread, so they just packed up everything, and, and as they packed up everything, they headed out. Okay, and then uh, there is a whole bunch of stuff that heads out from there, but that there, beloved, in Exodus chapter 12, is where the Passover is instituted. Okay, and in the institution of the Passover, God says, you are to do this every year in remembrance of what I did for you here. Okay? So the Passover has always had a connection to sacrifice, a sacrificial lamb, and blood. Okay? Now we fast forward a whole lot faster and a whole lot more forward, and we end up in the book of Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament. When we get to the book of Malachi, we read these words in chapter 1. Uh, beginning about uh, three quarters of the way through chapter 6, it says, O priests, who despise me? But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept that from you as a show of favor, says the Lord of hosts? So what happens then? I mentioned that God desired that the first and the best be offered to him. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. He deserves all of the best that you and I have. He deserves absolute honor and absolute worship. But the people had lowered the basket. They lowered the standard. Why? So they could easily make the baskets. So that the, so that the Passover dinner wouldn't be so difficult for them. Remember, the priest, what's their responsibility? They're the ones that got to make all the sacrifices. And if you don't understand the, the gravity of that is, the table of the Lord for the Old Testament was the altar, and all of the sacrifices that were made there were made by the, the priest. And so every time they made a sacrifice, there was blood everywhere. There was stench everywhere. Every time they cooked the, the meat, there was the smell of the meat. They didn't have all the good aroma uh, 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 of all the spices that we have nowadays, right? So it was a messy, messy, daunting task that was continual. It kept on going and going and going. And the priests were just wore out and tired. And so they lowered the standard. can't afford to lower the standard. Church can't afford to lower the standard. So what happens then? What happens then is we go through this 400 years of what's called intertestamental time. A lot of things happen. That's a whole sermon series all on its own. But then we end up where? With a new church. And how did we end up with a new church? Because we had a new covenant. You see, in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was that there had to be sacrifices made for the sins of the people and everything else. Okay? But then, then, then when we fast forward into the New Testament, we're under a new covenant. 
where there's only one sacrifice that ever needed to be made. And that sacrifice was sufficient for all of the sins of the world. That sacrifice was the Lord Jesus Christ. That sacrifice is a sacrifice that, that you and I, if we're really honest with ourselves, we can't really wrap our heads around the, 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 the uh, massiveness, the, the enormity of that sacrifice. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verses 16 and 17, we're going to work on your next point, and your next point is Passover turn to the Lord's Supper. Verse 16 says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Dropping down to verse 21, verse 21 says, and, and this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth, okay? So he's writing to believers in verse 21. He says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. You have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. What we read today, 1 Corinthians verses 23 through 27, I'm going to bring out to you a couple highlights out of this. The first one is this, okay, that, that, that Jesus came into this world to be that final and perfect sacrifice. He came into this world to institute a new covenant. He came into this world to set you and I free from the bondage and the slavery that we would have been under to our sins had he not taken them up upon himself. Jesus is the reason for everything that we do. He deserves great celebration in everything that we do, including the Lord's Supper. Sometimes we call it communion, right? Communion is, is the sharing of a life, a sharing of a life. Sometimes it's, it's called the Eucharist, okay? And, 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 and when it's called the Eucharist, it's, it's, a, it's a meaning of giving thanks. So what does that mean then? The Lord's Supper is pulling a chair up to the table with the Lord, giving him thanks and praising him for all that he has done for us, Amen. us undeserving ones. So when Jesus was betrayed, right before that, he had the apostles in the upper room. And he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In other words, I want you to become part of me. And when you become part of me, I want you to do this to remember that you have become part of me. How did you become part of him? If you're here today, you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, that's how. If you're here today and you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, well, you're not part of him. Okay? Just that simple. You're either in or you're out. Again, he says... Uh, 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 about the cup. This cup is the new covenant. There's that word covenant. Yeah. The new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So Jesus is saying all of that other stuff doesn't apply to the new church. So in the Old Testament, we have the Old Testament sacrificial system. In the New Testament, we have the new church. Okay? And the church, in, in celebrating the Lord's Supper, is participating in the life of Jesus Christ. But he says this then. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you, you, Proclaim the Lord's death until he 
Huh. What? You mean that in being a believer in Jesus Christ, pulling a seat up to the table and, 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 and participating in the Lord's Supper, that, that, that we're part of Jesus? We're part of the, the redeemed? Like the church at Corinth that Paul's writing to? And because of that, we have to talk about it? What? I mean, it, it, it says as plain as day. Right? You proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Anybody seen Jesus this morning? In the flesh, that is? No. Which means he hasn't came back today. Which means that you and I have to do something today. What do we have to do? We have to proclaim him. But who do we proclaim him to? Let's go back to chapter 10. What chapter 10 verse 21 say? You cannot share the cup with the Lord and the cup with the demons at the same time. You can't eat with the Lord's table. You can't eat at the Lord's table and then eat at the demon's table at the same time. It's unacceptable. You can't do it. Paul's telling the church in Corinth who are believers, they're part of the redeemed. Paul is saying you have lowered the basket and you're participating at two tables. You're trying to eat at the table of the Lord on Sunday and then, and then or Saturday in their time. You're trying to eat at the Lord's Supper on, on, on Sunday, we're going to say, and then from, Saturday, or from Monday through Saturday, you're pulling your chair up to the demon's table. You're like, no, I'm not. Okay. Whatever you say. The scriptures are pretty clear about it. But here's the exciting thing, church. We have the opportunity to participate in the Lord's Supper. We have the opportunity pull our chair up to the table of the Lord. But here's the decision we have to make. If we go back over to chapter 11, and we look at verse 27, it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body in the blood of the Lord. Always in the past, I've never neglected to do this, the importance of, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you probably don't want to partake in this Lord's Supper today. Okay? Always we invite everybody that, that claims to be a believer in Jesus Christ, whether you're members here or not, to celebrate this, this time of fellowship with us at the Lord's table. We always do that. But, beloved, I want you to watch this now and don't miss this. If you do it in an unworthy manner, there's a problem between you and Jesus. And a problem between you and me. And even a problem between you and the church. It's a problem between you and Jesus. And you're like, well, how does that happen? Well, you know, I don't know. Do you have unrepented sin? Sin that, 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 that you continue to, uh, to, to, to allow to consume your life and you allow to continue to participate in, do you have any of that? You know, hatred. You got any of that? You know, look here. If, if, you're, if you're harboring hatred, first off, that's not harming anybody but you. But second off, it's violating a commandment. So what are you doing then? Every day that you continue to carry that hate inside of you, you're just pulling your table right on up there to the demons, or your chair right on up to the demons' table. Say, let me eat with you. Maybe you're a faker. Maybe you claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You go through the motions, you tithe, you show up, you participate, and then you even been baptized. But you did it with the wrong heart. 
right? Yeah. What are you doing? You're folding your chair up to the table of the demons. You're taking the Lord's Supper unworthily. But then, beloved, there is good news. And the good news is this. Jesus will take your pain, your anger, your sins, your frustration, your fears. will take all of those things for you. All you got to do is give them to me. All you got to do is give them to me. Look, maybe you're, maybe you're struggling with the sin. I get that. But at least try to give it to Jesus. Maybe you're, you're struggling in your heart with some, some, some anger or hatred from, from years ago or, or even currently. I don't know, right? Maybe you're struggling with that. You know what? Look here. You don't have to go make amends with them people. But beloved, make amends with God. Right? Let God know that you don't desire to have this hatred, this anger, this, 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 this thing that's eating you up. You don't desire to have it and, and, and give it to the Lord. Because the good news is this. He's going to take it first and foremost and he says this. Today, Church of Virginia Hill, when you pull your chair up to the table of the Lord, you have the opportunity to proclaim to the table of demons, go to hell. Amen. Because that's where they come from. That's right. The table of demons is what carries you into hell. Amen. It is an eternal destiny for us to participate in a table with the Lord, in a table with the demons, is saying, Jesus, you're not enough. And I will take care of some things on my own. Today, the invitation is a little bit different. Actually, in closing the whole end of the service is a little different. We're going to participate in the Lord's Supper today. And we're going to take our little cups and, and everything and do our, do our stuff here. But my prayer is, I'm going to pray real quickly. And I'm going to give an invitation to the whole church. And this includes you on the video. The invitation is this. As soon as I get done praying, you have the opportunity to give the Lord your mess. Let him have it. And then after you do so, beloved, understanding the significance of being part of the life of Jesus Christ and celebrating this communion will have a far greater significance to you than it would have before. Okay. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the teaching of your word and the instruction that you give us. And Lord, I just pray that I have a pure heart. Father, I pray that your church has a pure heart. Father, we've come a long way together. We've, we've, we've rode on some rough roads, and we've had uh, some times of smooth sailing. But Lord, I, I pray that you remind us the significance of why and what we're doing so that we get excited about it, look forward to it. So Father, I ask that you join each and every heart under this roof and on this video at this very moment and you work inside us the way that only you can. So as we have a moment of silence, Father, I just pray for your will to stir each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray.
beloved with a pure heart. With a pure heart. There's two, two things here. The first one is the clear cellophane on the top. Okay, go ahead and peel that back and expose that unleavened, uh, unleavened wafer there. We read in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse 23 that Jesus took the bread and broke it. And when he had given thanks, like we just did, what did he do? They ate. So I'm going to ask you now, Father, family, with a pure heart, take of this bread. The text says in verse 25, in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. So the, the second layer there is, is a little aluminum foil deal. It's a, a little tough, and uh, I will evaluate that for you, okay, moving forward. Um, but the text says, this is reminding us of the new covenant. On the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ in Exodus chapter 12, the blood of the lambs shed. On the cross, the once and only perfect lamb shed. And he says, do it in remembrance of me. Take this drink. Lord, I pray that that was a different and joyful experience for you. You have the opportunity still to come to the altar. You have the opportunity to give your pain, your sorrow, and everything else away to God. And you also have your opportunity to come up here and ask Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And here, regardless of whether we're standing and singing or not, it doesn't matter. The altar doesn't care whether we're in the middle of a song or a middle of preaching, if a heart needs to be there, that's what it's there for. Okay? So Keith's going to close us out uh, with this last song.